Welcome. This is the second time we record the podcast. Yeah. Thank you very much for, that's, you know. That's absolutely fine. You know, so. coming here today. <laughs> You're about to leave to the States, right? Uh, yes. Yeah. On Friday. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. We're doing this at, you know, at the additional time. Like what they call, what they send football. Uh, extra time. Extra time. Yeah. yeah extra this time. is, this is. This is the extra this, this is the extra time. <laughs> yeah. Edition. Yeah. So, yeah, as I said, like, welcome to the Scientist Podcast. <laughs> this is the second time we do this. Uh, Tom, yep. please introduce yourself <laughs> to the... Yeah. I mean, this is pretty <laughs> awkward. We're doing this twice, so, you know... I, I, feel, I feel well practiced now. Well, I hope, I hope it comes across. At, at least um, hopefully, yeah, that, yeah. that was... Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm Tom, and I'm a, an evolutionary geneticist. So, um, I'm originally... From the UK, I grew up in the southeast of England, kind of close to London is probably the biggest city most people will know. Um, and then I studied genetics and systems biology in Cambridge, and then I went up to Scotland, uh, to St Andrews, where I did my PhD, um, and there I did kind of evolutionary genetics. And then I moved over here kind of September last year. Um, so now I'm a scientist at Reken, which is like a, I guess a kind of arm of the government. It's kind of like a science agency related to the government. Um, and there I work at this kind of interdisciplinary institute where um, there's a mix of kind of mathematicians and chemists and um, physicists and biologists um, like me. So yeah, that's, that's kind of my brief uh, <laughs> yeah. summary of my life so far. Well, thank you very much. Yeah. Riken, I mean, I the first time I've heard of Riken was when you know Yamanaka, right? Like the yes, Nobel, yeah, yeah. Uh, Nobel Prize winner. Yes, uh, he did his research on iPS cells, right? Yes, and that was my research on and my PhD. Yeah, I researched iPS cells, so I was really excited, you know, to kind of know about these cells and yeah. Little did I know that was one of the I don't I wouldn't say big mistakes in my <laughs> life, but it was quite difficult to. I don't know if you've dealt with iPS cells, but they're pretty no. tough i guess i can so i can imagine how to kind of coax them to yeah to get what you want them to do <laughs> yeah uh but yeah like how do you find you know life and work at Riken? like how how is it like yeah i think there's definitely something nice about being part of a big agency at least if you are like um i think not being from japan cheers yeah cheers, yeah. <laughs> cheers. um <laughs> there's lots of infrastructure i think to settle you and they have a like, accommodation on site so in terms of like the really boring logistical day-to-day -day stuff having a cafeteria on site mm. having really great facilities to work in um that's that's fantastic and um and yeah and then i guess like then there's all the science on top of that as well but i reckon probably um that's probably good elsewhere as well at different universities in japan and, and elsewhere i guess I, I don't really i can't really compare to that but i mean it's a fantastic place to work at least from my perspective so i see so, so regarding your you know your phd studies and mm -hmm. how do they relate to the work that you're doing at the moment mm -hmm. how I, I i did not mean to interrupt you no no it's okay no no <laughs> <laughs> yeah right so regarding, you know, the work that you did in your PhD and yeah. how does it relate to your work right now? So can you talk to us a little bit about it? Yeah. So I, I guess I'm quite, I mean, I, I guess sometimes uh, people's PhD is quite unrelated to what they end up doing. But I guess in my case, I'm quite lucky that I think a lot of the same themes and techniques that I learned in my PhD and um, I still apply now, really, um, just maybe on slightly different areas or slightly different topics. But, um, but it's very similar thematically. Yeah, so I guess like going back a step for my PhD, I, I studied, um, yeah, so I, I did evolutionary genetics for my PhD. And so for people who don't know, that's kind of, I guess for genetics, most people know genetics is the study of inheritance and how genes pass between kind of parents and offspring and how traits do too. Um, and then I, evolution really is the study of populations and how populations of organisms and change over time and the, the different forces that change them so yeah broadly those two kind of themes still track through to what i do today um although um i guess what i focus on mostly at the moment is to do with unusual genetic systems so genetic systems which are a little bit stranger or maybe people think about a little bit less um 
Yes. Why specifically those? Like, that's a, why, that's why, a good what, question. What, that's what good got question. you on this? Yeah, I think yeah. some of it is, I, I think, just naturally, kind of the things I'm interested in is often I kind of like things that are slightly odd or quirky or a little bit different because I think on one level it just helps you... It often enriches your understanding of the kind of um, more boring stuff. Like if you understand the slightly stranger, odder systems, it helps you understand the normal, quote unquote, normal systems a little bit better. Mm -hmm. I think also if from a more practical perspective, um, they provide really good tests of theory. Of like often, you're, if you're interested in why a theory works in a particular way, applying it to a strange case is often a really sometimes works out to be a very good test of that theory. I'm sorry, I'm gonna. Ke I keep jumping. That's back. that's that's fine. Oh, yeah, yeah. back right. <laughs> so, take a nibble of this. Do do? Yeah, please. So, you you're you're a biologist, right? Mm -hmm. So, did you go into biology like in your undergrad, right? Thinking that you're going to continue into a PhD and so on, where your career, you know, was always heading this way, or it just kind of happened. That's a good question. <laughs> Thank you. I guess um. <laughs> On one hand, maybe yes, but mm. but not really in a... I think some people have a very, very clear idea of where their path is going to go. Like they, even from a young age, you know, I think of people I went to school with who were, they knew they were going to be doctors or they knew they were going to do, be lawyers or something, I don't know, or some other career where they were very, very focused on getting mm. to that place. Mm. I think I kind of had a vague idea. I like doing science, but... Um, I didn't really have a clear idea that I was going to like end up doing science kind of professionally, permanently. Just each step along the path, it was like, that seemed like a interesting and um, kind of a, a good use of my time, an interesting thing that I'd like to do with my life. And lo and behold, that kind of, that led to, I don't know, doing a master's, doing a PhD, and being like, oh, I'd quite like to carry on and do a postdoc. Why didn't you, like, stop at master's, for example? Mm. Like, why, like, you did undergrad and then master's and then... What what did it take for you to take that one more step, huge step? Yeah, that's of true. Doing that's a PhD. True. That's true. Maybe that's the, that's a good that's a good point because I think um, I don't know about you, but I don't think I thought that hard about what a PhD entails before I I started. Like, um, I think particularly if you end up starting a PhD a bit younger, yeah. you don't really. One, realize the other things you could be doing. You don't, sometimes you don't think as hard about what the alternative options are. Mm. And you forget that it's like a big commitment of your time. Like you're committing a big chunk of your life. Like you can do a lot with four or five years, of, <laughs> yes. you know, three, four, five years of your life. And, um, and a PhD is not the only way to do that. But um, I'm glad I did. But, um, but yeah, I guess why didn't I do it? I, I think maybe just ignorance, really. I mean, as a, I'm glad I did, but maybe just... Um, I guess I didn't want to do science, but yeah, I didn't, as I said, I didn't think that hard and maybe other people should think harder. <laughs> no, no, I, I think this is an awesome, like, honestly, like research, I think it's one of the most fulfilling jobs that you mm -hmm. could do. Yeah. Especially since, you know, research that you publish is definitely, it's for the better of humanity, right? So what could, why are you smiling? <laughs> I, I think, um, <laughs> I think a bit of me still holds in my heart that like, optimistic view of, yeah. of research yeah. um, and there are some days it feels like that and then other days it very that much doesn't, doesn't feel like that yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I mean but if, eventually speaking like all of this information that you research everything all this data that you're getting that like ultimately mm -hmm. is used for the better of humanity right like one way or the other yeah you'd hope I mean I I think there is something very nice about waking up each day and clearly you don't just get to do what you want to do, but in broad outline, the kind of to have the flexibility to follow the questions and problems you think are interesting and questions that you're genuinely curious about the answers to, and um, and speaking to like interesting smart people about the problems that interest them and how they're trying to solve them, and that basic dynamic is, as you said, makes research really interesting and fun to be a part of. I think, and yeah. and probably, I mean, I reckon industry industrial research is similar to that. I mean, you've interviewed quite a few people from very different, I guess, flavors of science, right? That aren't purely yeah. academic, but I think there is something nice in more kind of pure, pure research, pure academia where, you know, you read an interesting paper and that will take up your week, right? That you'll end up 
um, following that path and seeing where that leads. And, yeah. Yeah, I really enjoy that. So, obviously, like we said, like research and academia is pretty interesting. Mm -hmm. and, and I do not mean in any way, shape or form to yep. say that you took the wrong step. Yeah. But mm -hmm. for example, for people who are like, they just... They're, they just had their bachelor's or like uh, they're about to graduate their bachelor's or they're about to graduate their master's. What are the career perspectives for these people? And how do they compare to, you know, taking four or five more years to do a PhD? Mm -hmm. And uh, how can I say? I, I wouldn't just say time-wise. I would say like, is it really worth it? Career-wise speaking, right? Like yeah. to do this, you know, one more step. Uh, in your opinion, that's a good question. I mean, I guess yeah. I guess um, there are probably good other people to ask who have like a better statistical understanding of like where paths lead. I would say it's probably a lot harder to get a permanent job in academia than I would have thought when I was an undergrad, for instance. Like, it's very. So, so your direction was academia, like, this is what you wanted? I don't think I really thought. But what I mean is I thought that's a path you could go down, and that's just like a career. Whilst I don't think I realized quite how competitive sometimes it can be to get permanent positions in universities, and, and that, that is sometimes a lot more competitive um, than, than maybe I would have thought at that time. Um, that said, I do think there are lots of things that you can do with a PhD that have nothing to do with academia or nothing to do with pure research. Like, there are many industries now that, I mean, at least for anyone who does anything vaguely mathematical and statistical, I mean, there's all sorts of industries that are crying out for people like that. And I do think, I think maybe the other thing coming back to that is like, talking about whether a PhD is like a good use of your time. I do think a PhD is, maybe I didn't realize this when I started, not necessarily suited for everyone in that some people love learning and love learning about things and love solving problems. Um, but Research isn't just learning. Sometimes it's, it can often be very, finding out new things is very demoralizing. Often there aren't free set answers. It's not like solving problems in a textbook or learning things from class. It's, a lot of it is almost um, an emotional ordeal of like going through <laughs> long periods where you don't really know what you're supposed to be solving. You know, finding out what the interesting question you're supposed to be answering is, is sometimes half the battle and, um, and yeah, I think research, I would definitely, if anyone who wants to do a PhD, I think getting some experience of doing research in a lab mm. is invaluable to understand maybe more what it's like than classes, because I think they're a bad, they don't necessarily prepare you well for what it's going to be like when, right. as you said, I mean, I mean, you have must have had this, like, you've worked very hard in an experiment and then it just fails. It just fails. <laughs> and yeah. there's... There's really nothing you can learn from that. It sometimes. happens. It happens way more often than you would like to admit, though, right? Like, because yeah. I remember my my professor used to say, like, nine ninety percent of research is failure. Yeah, I I wouldn't go as high as that, like, because <laughs> then you have a serious problem. But there is a big portion of research which is failure, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, along these years, how like let's say like. Uh, starting from your undergrad and until now, you've done a lot of research, a lot of learning, right? Yeah. How yeah. to do research. Yeah. What, what are the things that you find yourself like, like getting much better at? Like something that, you know, you, did, you were not so good back then and now you're doing really well. That's a good, that's a good question. I think I've got better at trying to focus on what I'm trying to answer because it's very easy sometimes to get lost in, there's just so much to know. Right, yeah. and there's so many things to find out, and sometimes you can become very unfocused and not necessarily devise good experiments or develop focused models because you haven't really thought that hard about what what is it you're trying to answer. And mm. I think so, preparing well in that sense, like before you actually do anything, spending more time thinking clearly about what other people have tried to answer, what you think is kind of doable, because also it's so hard sometimes to work out what you can even achieve, right? With research, sometimes it's like, it takes you many experiments or many models. It sometimes can take you months to work out even how and what to do, 
the thing you can do mm. is, right? Yeah. Maybe that sounds really kind of vague, but... I mean, it's, it's vague for somebody that yeah. did not do research before. But I imagine you know exactly yeah. what I'm talking about. I mean, if you about, did right? research, then you know <laughs> exactly yeah. what, what, what you're saying. And, and and this is like a thing that I, I'm actually... I, I hope that people who are listening to us would, you know, consider. Mm. Is that they... I mean, there would be a, a period of their time that they... Of, you know, their PhD studies that would, would they will... How can I say they would feel a little bit lost because they don't know exactly what they're doing. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. But, yeah. And, and that process of being lost is so normal. And it happens, I mean, it happens to me constantly. Like, you'll go through weeks where you, you're just not quite sure what is it you're trying to solve, where is it going, and that process, like, getting used to it, maybe that's another thing I think I've got bad at, which is, like, I guess when you've been through enough of those experiences, it's not necessarily you stop them from happening but you become more attuned to like getting through them right you this too shall pass kind yeah, exactly of. that's exactly it right <laughs> you kind of um you're like i know exactly why i'm feeling the way i'm feeling it's like a kind of meta like emotion it's like you're kind of used to feeling a particular way and you know as you said things will get better i will get through this oh. and um <laughs> yeah yeah okay so Basically, you know, right now your your position at Riken is like a, a research position, right? Yeah. And t tell me how does taking this position or like as it's kind of a new challenge, right? Yeah. Moving countries and moving to a country that does not speak English, basically. Yeah. How 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 is this? You know, how is this experience? Talk to us about this experience. That's true. I guess it's um. Yeah, I think for anyone who moves countries, you do have to be a little bit crazy. Like, there's something... Um, I totally agree, yeah. <laughs> there's something kind of mad in, like, moving um, away from maybe lots of things you know and um, to somewhere brand new. Um, but yeah, so, I mean, so I moved last September, and I was like, nine months now? It's nearly nine months? Sorry, I'm going like to interrupt you again. That's like, okay. This is a very bad thing. Yeah. But, yeah. What? motivated you to just jump ship like <laughs> that's a good question <laughs> i think all the way to japan i think i'd i mean i was speaking to my family about this actually the other day like yeah i think from when i was younger i did want to have the opportunity to move abroad at some point and definitely during my phd like i met so many i mean it's a lovely thing generally about academia um is that it's a very and research more generally is very very international and you meet people from all over the world and i think a bit of you meets all those people and kind of wants to experience what it's like to live elsewhere and um, live in a different culture and live in a different you know, research environment, but also kind of live a different lifestyle. So I wanted to do that. I didn't really expect to move to Japan. That was kind of uh, out of the blue, but I guess I saw a job that sounded interesting and I thought the people, there's some, some people I knew here who worked here and it sounded I wanted to work with and one thing leads to another and you kind of end up with an offer of a job that maybe you didn't expect and you're like, okay. I how did you find this job? Like, how did you find this, you know, opportunity? If I may ask. That's true. I mean, it sounds crazy now, but I saw this originally advertised on Twitter. There was also an on evolution, Twitter? an evolution um, website I follow that was built mostly on Twitter. Yeah. Actually, that's also how I found my PhD. Um, <laughs> Which is, I don't know, maybe that speaks so more to me. Social media is not a total waste of time then. Well, I wouldn't say that, but definitely, I definitely find like Twitter is slash was very good for um, lots of scientists spent maybe too much time on there. Um, but it was a really great way of like following lots of very niche areas of research and people who study those areas and seeing what they're up to and following papers, conferences, stuff like that. So yeah, uh, it's not all been wasted. Um, mm. Although maybe, maybe I should cut back just a little. Uh, so. <laughs> My, my Twitter account is, I think I wrote on it like science communication, photography, or arts maybe, mm -hmm. and FGC, which is fighting game community. I think it shifted dramatically into gaming right now, mm -hmm. <laughs> more than science, which I'm not really proud of. I really do love game. Do you game or, you know? Not, not really. I mean, I, I play like sports games, things like FIFA and NBA 2K, but mm. I wouldn't. I'm not good enough at anything. 
any other things to I think classify myself as a as a gamer. Well, yeah. But it, it, anyways, like I I I think I should work a little bit harder on my mm. science communication game on Twitter. I see. <laughs> <laughs> it's just been gaming nonstop. But yeah. So. Yeah, you need to create your Twitter feed, maybe. Yeah, a little bit better, cause. But I, I still want to use it for gaming. Like, honestly, yeah, it's it's maybe start another Twitter, but I don't want to do that either, cause it's creating too many accounts is also like not yeah. a. I think though one of the things about yeah. social media platforms like that that was, yeah. as you know, again, it's changed quite a lot more recently, but it is the chance to maybe multiple things you're interested in is connect them and see them all at once and. You definitely see that people from different fields connecting and listening to each other's work. And that's the the best side of it is something like that where you do you get to hear about things that maybe you would never consider. That that we derailed a little bit. We derailed a little bit, yeah. Though, yeah. Going back into, you know, science. Yes. Good thing is that, you know, science language is English, right? Yeah. Otherwise this would have been a, a very different experience for everybody involved in, in moving to Japan. Yeah. But uh, how how did you, how do you, like, maybe inside of Riken, like, everything is in English, probably? Um, it's kind of, everything is bilingual, I would say, is that, bilingual. I mean, I mean, it depends, kind of, um, almost all the, kind of, logistical stuff is both in English and in Japanese. Mm -hmm. um, I would say, I mean, most of the time I talk to people, most people are talking English, but that just might be me because uh, like I'm an idiot who doesn't speak much <laughs> Japanese. So, um, so yeah, I would say it's kind of, kind of in in both both languages. Both but language. yeah, outside, how do you how do you deal with, you know, outside of work? Like you you have to do different things like in order to live in that's Japan. That's true. Right? That's true. I mean, how, how do you? Oh, I guess badly is the answer, but uh, I mean. I think being here enough, you start to like, I do think like l learning the language before you come to Jamahan is maybe more important than elsewhere. Maybe other countries, maybe people would consider going to. Um, and it's also quite hard. I, I don't think I realized quite how hard it is to learn language when it's not your primary, uh, oh. primary like goal with your time. Like when it's something you do as a, a few hours in the evening, when you have some energy, um, it's quite quite hard. But I don't know. I've got a little bit better at like being able mm -hmm. to read mo read things in. Oh. Um, so in you're Japanese. actively learning Japanese at the moment. I I would I don't know. I'm like active in the way that a, a, a jog once a week is active, um, but maybe not active isn't like a a gym goer mm -hmm. version of like learning languages. Uh -huh. is like I see. maybe that's the kind of on that spectrum of how active are you. Yeah. Practicing Japanese, I think I'm on the the lower end. Lighter side. Yeah, maybe the doctor would be like, you need to you need to do a little bit more. But I I think last time we talked, you said yeah. like you had a you have a friend in Japan already. That's true. Right? That's true. Actually, again, I'm, I mean, you can't. Uh, it was really helpful for me actually to have um, have a friend who'd already moved here a few years ago, and his Japanese is really good and. I guess it's nice to have somebody that um, whenever you move somewhere new, right, to have somebody you know well and um, so you don't feel quite so alone. I mean, I'm very lucky to have that. And um, and he was very helpful at just explaining lots of... Again, it's, it's hard to explain just how much culturally can be different when you move, move somewhere for people who've not lived abroad. Mm -hmm. Kind of really boring, basic things like banking and recycling and um, oh, yeah. stuff that maybe you don't anticipate is, um, is different. I mean, we talked about this last time that, that there's a national holiday and the banks just closed and yeah. uh, you can't get any money out of the cash point. And yeah. that was definitely a, a shock, culture shock to me. Of being yeah. like, what am I going to do? How am I going to feed myself without... And by the way, like recently it's, it's, it's improved a lot since, you know, you can buy things almost everywhere using a credit card mm. or like PayPay, yeah. which is Japanese version of PayPal, right? Mm -hmm. But until before the Olympics, some, not so many places actually would only deal in cash, which was terrible, <laughs> yeah. to be honest, if, if you didn't have cash with you, you know, and one of these holidays hit and you cannot even, you know, withdraw some money, right? But yeah, it's just one of those things that you get used to after living yeah. here, right? 
Yeah, exactly. And I mean, I mean yeah. you must have had the same experiences, right? When you, oh, yeah. It's just like <laughs> lots of things. It's not that they're good or bad. It's more they're different. different. You, it's, it's the process of you adjusting. It's, yes. Um, it's, it's a whole different culture and you just have to adjust to it, right? Yeah. yeah. Talking about a whole different culture. Yeah. Uh, being in a PhD nice is a whole different yeah. thing, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's a whole different experience, you know, from like, let's say, you know, after you work in, after you graduate, for mm -hmm. example, like it's not as stressful, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, definitely before PhD, I think even in master, masters is, wouldn't be that difficult because you're basically studying some materials and taking examinations and that's the gist of it, kind of, yeah. right? Uh, I I want you to talk to us and to me again. Yes, yeah. <laughs> about you know <laughs> things that you used to, you know, kind of lift your mind off. You know, yeah, your studies and you know the stress that comes associated with PhD. That's that's true. I mean, so I think I never want to like underestimate how hard. Like I remember going back to talk about masters or something like that. Those things are really hard uh, and like. As you said, it's no, 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 but I, I was just saying, I think the kind of things that make a PhD hard are quite different maybe from what, as you said, it's the kind of, that sense of feeling quite lost sometimes and quite yeah. lonely and um, and a sense of you spend a lot, really, you work really hard and you can't really see the end. The gap between when you yeah. do do things and when the outcome comes is so long and yeah. and you often have to project manage yourself in a way that often you're badly prepared to do. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think things that definitely helped me was just having hobbies and things you do outside of um, a PhD or having things that you can feel more concretely attached to when you um, you do them and you can see the outcome and you can you can remind yourself that you can do things and make progress. You know, I really enjoyed doing teaching when I was um, throughout my PhD. It's something just more concrete that you could go in, you could teaching. go in for a class. Yeah, yeah. So we did things like... You'd often have some kind of teaching responsibilities you could sign up to do when yeah. I was at, um, in St Andrews, and so that there's a it's very tangible. You can go in, you can do a good job for an afternoon, and you feel like okay, I've done something right, <laughs> rather than like a your own research which you can work a month on and feel like what have I done. Um, so th that was definitely helpful, and I think just having hobbies, having other things that distract you, and you can again run around for two hours. You know, I love doing sports. Um, so running around for a few hours playing football or hockey and um, you, it's great. You play hockey too? Well, so I used to play, I mean, this was great. There's a lovely community in St. Andrews of like floorball, which is like not quite hockey, but kind of hockey. So it's like a um, the kind of ball is kind of like a light plastic ball and the sticks are much lighter Hold and that. plastic. What, hockey? Hockey is isn't is it on that ice? Right? So this isn't ice hockey. So I guess there's different flavors of hockey. Mm. I guess there's like mm. maybe ice hockey is maybe more famous, maybe. Yeah. Um, but there's also well, growing up, like hockey on like astroturf was quite popular. So these are the balls really heavy. The sticks are oh, kind of I... wooden. That kind of hockey, yeah, yeah. So I don't know. Maybe you've seen it at the Olympics or when you have the kind of big wooden sticks and. Uh, there is. Do you know MKBHD? The famous YouTuber, like no, he's I've a tech been, reviewer. Yeah, I think yeah. he does a form of that. Too. Okay, yeah, maybe. If I'm not mistaken, no, I mean, I don't know. I have no idea. Um, but I think I, 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 see, I know yeah. what you're saying. That, but we played like a version of that that was much lighter ball. Uh -huh. um, you play indoors with kind of plastic sticks, and um, oh. it was just basically an excuse to run madly round for like an hour. Do, do like you an, also follow the tradition of? Ice hockey or no? Not really. I mean, so I don't know. Maybe people. I think people who look at the UK and see how northern it is would think that there's loads of maybe wintry stuff. And if you've been to the UK, there just isn't that much snow. There's like so ice, ice sports, ice hockey are not really a. I was. A thing I, at all. I was referring to a much more traditional thing about ice hockey, which is like you have to fight in. The oh, game. you you gotta hit each other. I see. I see. I see. I mean, was there fighting? Was there fighting? <laughs> I mean, I used to throw a few sneaky elbows, yeah. you know, into the ribs, and but yeah, um, that was a spark. Or kind of make sure you get your bum like into, <laughs> yeah. like, I don't know. But no, I didn't. I didn't punch anyone. I can. Yeah. There was nothing. So 
that's a very big difference than... Or at least no one's going to say that. <laughs> yeah. Something that I was quite surprised about. Mm-hmm. My, so my friend Hamad is from Saudi Arabia and he did his master's in Scotland also. Yeah. And he said that rugby is is quite big over there. Yeah. Yeah, it is. I, I don't know, like, I, I thought that England or, like, mm. UK in general is football. Like, is football is, like, the main thing and yeah. everyone is excited about it and everything is thrown to the side, but apparently not rugby? Yeah, that's true. I think, so, I think sports, sorry, of the sports mm. in the UK, I think definitely football is still the most popular, but definitely in Scotland, um, rugby is also very, very popular. Same in Wales, I would say, um, I mean, it is popular in England, rugby as well. Um, whilst in England, I think cricket is maybe a bit more popular than maybe rugby. I don't know why Scotland suits rugby. Maybe because I think of <laughs> rugby as a sport to be played in, like, the rain and the mud. And I don't know. I think of, maybe I'm just, like, having flashbacks <laughs> to school days where being sat on by people, like, twice my size. And, um, yeah. Well, yeah. So... Last time when we talked, like yeah. you mentioned that you're an Arsenal fan, right? Yes, yes, yeah. Uh, tough season, huh? I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm yeah. Go that's through true, the that's true. That's true. I mean, I've got to experience this all again. It's yeah. like having a, yeah, having flashback. I was gonna say, I think, I think now we've there's been a, a few weeks from the demise. Mm-hmm. It's been, I think overall this season has been a very successful one. I think. It was just a very depressing end to like mm. a season that was almost too good, but like things reverted a bit back to normal in a. Yeah. Do, yeah. do, do you still follow the news quite closely and the signings and everything, or you just like kind of skip? I try and skip, follow as closely yeah. as I can, in part because it's nice to feel a bit more. I mean, this is the nice thing actually about having things like that when you move abroad that kind of you make you feel a bit more attached to home and um, and to follow. Um, but it is definitely, I mean, I imagine you've experienced the same thing. Time zones make some things significantly more difficult to follow when football matches are on at like two in the morning and, um, it's, it's nuts. It's, uh, it's nuts. Yeah. It's just, it's, I, I used to follow Real Madrid. Like there was no way that I would miss a game. Mm-hmm. Like no way. Like yeah. that's not happening. I tried to do the same after moving to Japan and just failed miserably. The, I, I remember winning the La Decima, like the 10th, yeah. right? I watched that live. Mm. I was up 3 a.m. <laughs> watching yeah. the game. But that was, I think that was the last time I was actually really like following yeah. fo- like football because time difference is crazy. Was that the Atletico Madrid final? Oh, yeah. yeah that was the, the, the Ramos yeah. header yeah. and like Bale's goal. Like, <laughs> have you saw, did you see that watch the, that the game live uh i think i would have done it. yeah 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 as soon as i saw ramos goal yeah i was like we're winning uh, uh, yeah i, I mean was, I, I think i, I just I desperately wanted atletico to win i think i just have a a very slight Why? vendetta against real madrid um i think i think there are certain clubs like madrid and manchester united i think great i mean manchester united less still now <laughs> certain clubs who just they just always find a way to win. Like, even when they're bad, they, their way when they're good, they win. Yeah. When they're bad, they win. They just have like a, they feel almost like royalty that you just can't get rid of them. Like, I mean, they're uh, called royal. Yeah, exactly. Or real. Exactly. real. <laughs> yeah. Not, not so much about Manchester United, though. Yeah, I mean. This goes out to Allah, my friend. Yeah. I used to love Manchester United. Mm-hmm. Until he made me hate him. Mm-hmm. He loves the team way too much mm-hmm. that, you know, that makes you hate, Yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah. everything about <laughs> the club. I don't, I wouldn't say that I hate it, yeah. but let's say I like it a lot less yeah. than I used it before. Because yeah. he's so obsessed with it. Like, I, I don't know, maybe in England, it's a, is it a thing like with like football fans that are com- Completely not somebody. There are like people who are like, yeah, off their rocker completely. And I would understand that because they're from England and yeah. it's an English team. We have the same back in Yemen. Yeah. <laughs> We're like, 
<laughs> thousands of kilometers of yeah. thousands, uh, probably yeah. thousands, right? Yeah, but yeah, it's it's still the same thing. I think I love that about sport, though. I mean, as you said, kind of, it's great to have that kind of sports hate. Where it's just not, it's, there's nothing rational about it. You just like, right? You get to, you get to hate something for no good reason, and um, but there's something very unifying, as you said, about sport. Where you you can meet somebody from thousands of miles away, and yet you both care really deeply and stupidly about the same dumb game and about the same dumb team yeah. and you're like there's no there's no reason We're behind this now. <laughs> what? and then you're friends right like exactly exactly it's kind of um mm. yeah bonds you in a really uh, really silly way yeah yeah but for that reason i think i need to start supporting a good Jap- uh, japanese football team i need to pick like uh, i tried yeah i i don't i even went to a couple of friendly matches mm-hmm. Uh, the one with Manchester United, I think that was with a Yokohama team. Mm-hmm. And then one with Manchester City, and that was in Saitama. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think the one in Saitama was Orawa Reds. Yeah. I think. Yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah. I don't know. <laughs> I don't, it's, it's not the same when you're watching, like... I don't know. I think this is the thing about being a fan of a club. Like yeah. you don't care how bad they are. You just love the team. That's true. You just yeah. follow them. Yeah. I couldn't do that with any of the teams here. Yeah. I just feel that they're bad. You know, yeah. <laughs> like especially you know watching La Liga and you know the Premier League. Yeah. Like that's yeah. top level football, right? Yeah. And anything else, like when you see it, is just. You keep comparing it to it. Yeah. And it's just not a fair comparison. Yeah. Yeah. Although I think there's something, as you said, like there's something great about, I mean, definitely in England, I think one of the best things about English football is just how deep the support for clubs goes through the period. Like you'll get, you know, third division, fourth division teams that will have like thousands of fans turn up to every match. And yeah, I think that kind of madness is like, as you said, you support a team regardless of, how good or bad they are, they're just like, you get attached to them and they become, yeah, you become yours. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, did, did you talk to anyone about uh, playing football in Japan or like futsal? Oh, so there is I think like last a, time we, we talked, talked a little about bit about football. So yes, yeah, so there is like a football team in Rican. I don't know whether there's a futsal team specifically. Um, mm. But you said you played futsal occasionally here, right? Long time ago. Long yeah. time. Before <laughs> all of this. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but yeah, it's it's quite fun. It, mm-hmm. It's uh, for the lack of a better term, it's I, I don't know how to say it to be honest, but it's just it feels like you're outside playing, mm. but you're just on top of a building, yeah, surrounded by fences, like, yeah. like a, a very high fence, yeah. And in the beginning, like when you're going up the elevator and you'll be like what the hell how are we going to play in this place but then after that you just kind of forget all about that yeah. so you, well, which position did you say you play uh, I, I kind of play I mean I play kind of in the midfield center midfield probably that's where I played most of my so you have very good passing I think maybe that was one of the things I was better at I used to do a lot of running a lot of passing and a lot of like tackling like tackling. those are the three I was like somewhere between, I was like kind of Mascherano, you know, you, uh-huh. don't, you don't think of him as a particularly, I don't want to like talk badly Mascherano, I was going to say, he's not, a sil- he's, not, he's not a silky player, but he's kind of like very functional and works hard. Well, there's like, like a box to box player. Box to box, but maybe without the goals, I never really scored many goals. Yeah. Um, yeah but How's your shooting? Still pretty horrendous. I mean... <laughs> <laughs> really? I don't know. I don't know what it is. Maybe, maybe that's why I should. Eat. I've never. I don't know why. Yeah, I just. I'd much rather set somebody up than then shoot you well. Yeah, but I don't know. I don't know what that says about me. Um, but Actually, yeah. you know, setting up goals was yeah. True. You that's know, Guti, Guti, Guti. Yes, the Madrid. Yeah, yeah Madrid player. player. That guy's passing was like pristine. Mm. I I did I didn't I I don't think I remember him scoring many goals at yeah. least nothing that is like mm. like noteworthy, but his assists yeah. were like silk. Yeah, right? it's like Özil, I guess, is another player that you think of Ozil. as a player who 
I mean, he actually, he does have some quite nice goals to his oh, name, yeah. doesn't he? But as, again, as a player who you pink. think of as a wonderful, a wonderful passer. And, um, yeah. But yeah, I don't know. I mean, the great thing is, like, playing sport, watching sport. I think mm. there are so many lessons for, like, life in general that you can take from ultimately meaningless stuff at the end of the day. Like, yeah. I mean, we talked a bit about kind of resiliency. I remember when I was growing up, the football team I was part of, we were good for a little bit, but a lot of the time we were quite bad. And the, I don't know, just like perseverance through that and working as a collective and going through periods where you are really bad, you lose 7-1 week after week. And then, but that kind of, that being <laughs> that's said, like traumatic. Did you, but, yeah. did you see, I think this season there was an Italian team that finally won a single game against i think against roma right i did they, not they see this yeah, yeah. Roma from getting the title i see okay yeah and that, that was, was the only game, game they won, they won. Mm. <laughs> that's wonderful so was, and they were celebrating like crazy you yeah. know what, with, with their fans and everything that they they finally won a game that's that's what season. our football team is like although we yeah um and that's that that one victory is so much sweeter like when you've worked when you've worked for it I mean, yeah, definitely. No one wants to lose all the no time. One wants but, to, yeah. yeah, but when that win comes, like it's, it's true. And it's you learn a lot from failure. That's a like learning to take failure well. I think is a good yeah. life lesson. Yeah. Mm. Uh, do you know anybody at Rican like that likes football? Do you talk to them about football, or is it just like work? Actually, it's, I mean, the, one of the reasons, one of the people I um, mm. know best at Rican um, is like also a massive Arsenal fan. So. And also loves football, so um, that definitely. I'm not saying that's why I moved to Japan, but uh, <laughs> was he the one that intro like? Introduced yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, so, yeah, so probably that's the reason. That's the like, destiny. Come on, destiny, exactly. <laughs> yes. So, um, we, I think we talked about good things and bad things that happened. You know, mm -hmm. that could happen during PhD and yeah. things like that, but. Um, was there something that was like noteworthy or like an experience that happened to you during your PhD mm -hmm. that kind of stuck in your brain and kind of like, I can't really forget about that thing and it led me to do this and that or? Um, I don't know. I mean, there was like this global pandemic. That was one thing. Oh, yeah. That was that, that happened. I, I, I don't think That's I've definitely... heard of them that much. Yeah. yeah, I don't know. Maybe you've heard. Yeah, maybe you've heard. Maybe, of it. No, maybe, maybe it wasn't not. a thing here. <laughs> yeah. Maybe. Um, but I mean, that was definitely a, 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 that was, <laughs> that was definitely a big How um, did it affect your thing. PhD? That's, I think I was lucky in the, so I think, I mean, I was around some people who their PhDs or master projects were com completely thrown off and they showed a remarkable degree of resilience and, you know, field work they were meant to be doing was cancelled or, I mean, my friend, she basically, um, she basically moved all of her experiments to our house uh, and continued her, her kind of her cricket experiments there, which was... Cricket? Yes, yeah, so these were, she... <laughs> okay. She works on, um, she doesn't anymore, but she worked on these um, crickets who... Um, they, they have basically to step back. Typically, crickets the males sing to attract females. Mm -hmm. In this population in Hawaii, there's a fly that's attracted to the song, and basically this parasitic fly that hunts them down based on the singing. So what's happened is there's a population of crickets that no longer the males no longer sing. So actually, a couple of my friends they study the ways in which they've evolved not to sing. So you can kind of see that it's like a nice evolutionary example in real time. Mm -hmm. Of You can see the population changing. and um, So they, they've done lots of field work and studies to do with that. But anyway, so my friend, she brought back all these crickets to our house. And basically, one room in the house was turned into a, a mini lab. So there's, there's her by day working on that. There's me kind of in my room working on chunking through some maths and um yeah i think many people i guess adapted to very weird and unusual working patterns to kind of get through i don't know how you dealt dealt with it like um i mean to be honest in the beginning it was good mm -hmm. it was good for me because at that time my wife and kids just 
came from Yemen. Mm -hmm. And we haven't been together for like three or four years. Mm -hmm. So it was kind of a good time. Yeah. You know, I'm finally with my family and working from home mm -hmm. kind of gave us a little bit of a time to kind of bond again and, yeah. you know, enjoy the family time. By the end of the lockdown, my wife was telling me, get the, get the hell out. Yeah. Like, just leave. Yeah. You know, you're, yeah. you're too much kind of thing. Because everything started irritating me. I don't mm. know for some reason, but yeah. It was definitely a weird... I think you can be with people too much, right? However lovely and however much you love I them. I never like, thought of that, but yeah. yes, absolutely. Yeah. Sometimes you need a bit, a bit more space. Yeah. 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 When you talked a little bit earlier about evolution, right? Yes, yeah. And, uh, and I think we need to touch a bit more on your, That's true, you know, okay, your research, yeah. right? Okay. Like it's, it's kind of a science communication <laughs> podcast. Kind of turned into a sports podcast in the middle. In the middle, kind of. But yeah, so regarding evolution yeah. and uh, you know your work, obviously, you know, if you look at evolution from a very long time ago until now, there are huge steps, mm -hmm. you know, and obviously, you know, you can see them. Mm -hmm. But how about you know changes that are happening like right now? Does evolution? accelerates during like this age or no because i think so many changes happen at the same time right now during these last few years especially maybe like like last 10 20 years mm -hmm. everything is just happening so much faster does that also affect evolution or like maybe not so much i guess it depends i mean as you said like there's been lots of humans have put envi huge environmental changes right on the planet, and yeah. so it wouldn't surprise me if many organisms are experiencing really dramatic changes to their environment. So selection is quite strong. Mm. Um, but yeah, I mean, talking of like examples of just selection acting, I mean, there's all sorts of. You see, I think people maybe don't realize quite how much. Like evolution isn't something that just happened millions of years ago. Kind of evolution is it's kind of a continuous continuously thing. happening all around us, right? Even when you think of um, changes that aren't happening, they're not happening because processes are maintaining them as they are, right? If it weren't mm. for um, selection, then mutations would just accumulate, and um, most things would probably get worse over time. But yeah, I mean, lots of examples that people might know of the things like the bacterial. Like antibiotic resistance is a big problem in the world at the moment. Yeah. And again, that's a kind of maybe the most direct example of evolution um, you can see in action, right? As um, we've applied loads of antibiotics, and then as a result, those bacteria have evolved resistance to the antibiotic treatments, and um, yeah, to maybe multiple antibiotics as well. And that's a that's a huge problem. Or even with COVID, I mean, I think I don't think people realize that was incredible the amount of genetic data we have. On that, on the virus and different viral strains evolving in real time, I mean it's remarkable. Um, really, the genetically speaking, you know, we used to have flu shots every year. Yeah. Because obviously, you know, flu virus keeps mutating every mm -hmm. year, right? And we had a problem with it that way. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So when it came to Corona, yeah, and COVID, right? How? What happened there? Like, is it mutating even faster than regular, you know, flu? Or, I mean, so one, like, there are people in much better place to ask these questions. But my impression <laughs> from, from what I know is that actually coronavirus is... Or, I mean, I, I said it's difficult. My, my impression was that they tend to evolve a little bit slower, some of them, than um, flu viruses. Mm. But in part... Um, Part of the problem as well is you're just dealing with huge population sizes as well. You know, think of how many people have infected with coronavirus. Yeah. Um, there's just so many op like opportunities for mutation to happen. But yeah, I mean, I don't want to say anything too wrong because I'm not a virologist, and I know people who are who know a lot more virology than me. So uh, yeah, don't want to um, don't wanna <laughs> don't wanna interrupt them. You know, direct applications of research. Mm, yeah. For example, sometimes. Uh, people do not realize how much research is connected to real life, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Like re regarding research that you're doing, right? Yeah. And um, I think the first time I heard 
about your research was in Tokyo Nerd Night. Yeah. You fooled me. Yeah. Shame on you. <laughs> I, I thought it was about something else. Yeah. That was clickbaity. Yeah. For, for people who don't know, the title was, was called Sex Education. Yeah. Although... I was there for sex education. And yeah. there was... There was a lot of sex, but maybe not... Not the one that... Maybe people, people weren't thinking about, yeah. you know... Insects and rotifers and yeah, yeah. but definitely very in, in, interesting. Mm -hmm. Like especially the species, I I don't think I've like the, the species you chose. Like, no, exactly. I, I don't think yeah. I've heard of any of them. Yeah. to be honest. Well, right? that's that's good. I'm glad because um, there's there's so much diversity. I mean, that's one of the lovely things about biology is I think people sometimes forget quite how much diversity of life is out there and organisms which live completely different lives to ours and mm. at a completely different pace or style of lifestyle and like <laughs> it's it's crazy it's crazy and mm. it's, um yeah but yeah so regarding you know the research that you're doing it's 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 very specific i would say right and it's very like i, I would say it not many i i, I don't want to generalize it like yeah. not many people do it but like uh, how come you chose this particular subject and how, what are the applications of, of this research on, on real life? How do you communicate it? That's true. That's true. Okay. So, so I guess, yeah. So as I said, I study kind of unusual genetic systems, which tend to be less well studied. As you said, fewer people tend to work on them and they mm. tend to be odd for that reason. Mm. Um, but nonetheless, there are some like really nice practical applications. So, I mean, to give some examples, right? So one of the, things we're working on at the moment is we're working on the genetics of this um, fly, um, a group of flies, fungus gnats, um, which if any of you have any pot plants at home or any, if you've, um, uh, then actually it might be a big pest for you. They're commonly like a big horticultural pest, but people often have them in their pot plants. They're kind of tiny little black flies and they're also a big problem in mushroom farming. So we study them because the genetics of them are really funky and interesting, mm. but learning more about their genetics and learning more about how they work is really useful if you, for other researchers who maybe want to find a way to more effectively kill them or reduce their populations, right, that aren't damaging to plants. You know, if you think of how many, um, how often we have to apply huge numbers of pesticides, right, to try and reduce the kind of burden of pests um, on crops and um if you can find more effective ways to do that that don't involve huge amounts of chemicals, which often kill lots of species you don't want to kill, mm -hmm. um, then so that's that's an example of the kind of research which might lead and from from the stuff I do or even I mean another thing we're doing is to do with like um, chimerism. So this is where this is a very funky thing where I mean so you've got children chimerism. Yeah, so chimerism is where an individual contains um, cells from another body. Um, so they're kind of a blend of two different cell lineages. Do you watch anime? I don't watch any anime. Is there a nice anime example yes, of this? I think, uh, what was it? Full, Full Metal Alchemist? Full Metal Alchemist? Okay. Yeah, you should, you should, I should, I should watch like, this. At least they for like definitely pop have culture. a camera thing about it. Yeah. <laughs> At least let's have some pop culture I was like, references. I've heard this word before. And unfortunately, not in a science comics. <laughs> it was an anime. Yeah. Um, but one of the yeah. things that really cool things that people have found more recently is to do with um, actually during pregnancy that are kind of offspring and their mothers will often pass cells to one another. And so those cells will stay in the mother for a long time afterwards. So, um, so actually, yeah, most of the kind of mothers out there will have some of the cells from their children probably still in them now. And, um, really? and um, so there's kind of some theory and like work to try and explain why that might happen, what the consequences of that are. And that's a nice example of where kind of the theoretical biology I do, where some of it's a bit weird to try and understand systems that are a little bit stranger than that. Things like some strange algae or some um, monkeys that also do this kind of thing. But that understanding those processes maybe helps us understand a bit better humans and some of the outcomes of pregnancy and um, how to prevent some of the um, pathologies that come about with pregnancy. Um, so... Yeah. Regarding pathology. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Last time when we spoke, you told me about cancer and that yeah. cancer is actually, you know, yeah. part of evolution, I guess. Like, yeah. Yeah. Evolution has to do a lot with cancer. That's true. Yeah. Cancer yeah. Cancer has to do a yeah. lot with evolution. And 
that was pretty fascinating. You know? Yeah. So to actually, you know, have that perspective, so mm. it's, it's kind of crazy. To That's be true. Honest. Yeah, I think I think sometimes evolution and really just change your perspective on how things work. Like as you said, we think of ourselves as a unified whole. You think of you as you, and I think of me as me. <laughs> and we sometimes forget that we are ourselves, like a little population of of cells. Right? You started off with one little cell, and that's now like honestly like when you really come to think do, do you think this way or not like i don't know like yeah. maybe it's just me and i'm mm -hmm. weird that way but i still cannot wrap my head around that we are composed of cells yeah you know cells make you know tissues and tissues make organs and organs like and, and it's just like and then this is me and i'm basically composed of all of these cells i still I know it, mm -hmm. <laughs> but I still can't wrap my head around it. Yeah. I don't know. Do you have this? No, I mean, it's slightly mad, isn't it? I mean, it is crazy. I think there's lots of things like that in science where sometimes you can deal with something on a day-to-day -day basis and it's normal, and then you think a bit harder about what it means, yeah. and it, it blows your mind. It's like, kind of often for me, that's thinking about the scale of things, right? When you think of the scale of human history, you know, you're suddenly, it's kind of mind-boggling, right? You're kind of, oh my God, like... Some, that yeah. is one another thing is like the size of how are we compared to the universe yeah there was this animation i think it's also like one of the best science communication animations that i've ever seen which shows like i don't know if it starts with humans but i think i maybe it starts with the earth mm -hmm. right and then it starts showing mm -hmm. it you know scale wise compared to all of these you know not just planets, but like galaxies and like it was insane. And to be honest, we tend to forget, <laughs> you know, yeah, we're all wrapped up in our in our own lives, and then we forget the scale of which you know this universe is, right? Absolutely. I mean, I mean, I get to work around a lot of physicists, and and yeah, sometimes you'll listen to their presentation, and it is just mind boggling, right? As you said, the kind of scale of things, and but equally for you, sometimes you forget that. The variation in organisms and the scaling, those scaling properties and, you know, how you think of the world works at your kind of scale of life is very different from if you are a tiny, tiny organism. You know, physics works differently if you're a pond skater or, like, everything is different. What's a pond skater? I like one of those little insects that kind of skates on the water and... Um, oh, right, yeah. Because then, for them, like, for instance, the water, the, they're light enough, the surface tension... It's really strong well, relative it's to called their weight. Skater? I, I know the I well. Know I don't know what they. I yeah, don't yeah. know what like what? again. Maybe they're not called that in Japan. I'm I'm getting so I used no to so many species that I'm so used to in the UK that are weird yeah. here, and similarly species that are very normal here. Where I'm like, oh my god, like <laughs> like when I first arrived, the um, yeah. cicadas. I mean, you must. I mean, I don't know how big of a shock that was. Do to you, you like him? Do you like that sound or no? I think I love them because they're so new to me. I think for people who, I mean, for people who I maybe don't who, like... who, who don't know, <laughs> these are insects that just make, in Japan, they're just like, they are the sound of the summer, aren't they? Like, yes, these, um, that's what they refer to them. They, they, they are so noisy. It's hard to kind of, it's you've been here, like, how, they're just, they're just so loud. They're just, they're so, just loud. so loud, right? Yeah. And, and for me, being loud is fine. Mm. The thing is that they have a very short lifespan, right? Mm. And yeah. then they die, but they don't die immediately, right? Yeah. They they kind of just lay around, and some of them suddenly jump on you, yeah. and they f scare the hell out of me, to be honest. So, I mean, this links nicely back to the football, so I don't want to butcher <laughs> this entirely. but yeah. um, So, you know, they're, they're called semi in Japanese, maybe. Yeah, semi, right. So, apparently, that, like, half-dead state, people call, like... The semi final, like <laughs> really, apparently <laughs> that's the thing. <laughs> Which I, when my, my friend told me that, I was like, This is this is what wonderful. Is this is like, um, yeah, so, um, well, yeah, yeah. anyways, the like, cicadas, I don't like, I nope. don't like, I don't like, I don't like, <laughs> but, but for me, there's so many, um, there's so, so many j insects which are so much bigger in Japan than in the UK, for example, and, um, and just like, yeah, it's just so wonderful to come to somewhere where. All the nature is quite is quite different. The, the, they have this. I don't know what you call those insects with so many legs. I forgot the name. Of like them. a kind of millipede or a centipede. Kind of or centipede, like a centipede. centipede but mm -hmm. honestly, I had to Google it because on my way from home to the station, yeah, there are like a, a lot of trees. Yeah, 
And then there was one time that they kept falling yeah. out, out of trees. Mm-hmm. That it freaked me out. I, I, I really sound like a chicken. Oh. Yeah. And I thought I was being careful. Mm-hmm. And because I don't know if you've seen a centipede, but they look pretty gross or like. At least for me. I don't know. Yeah, may- I think I'm maybe more used to seeing lots of um, weird, gross, like gross <laughs> critters. Like, it's less gross to me now, I think. That being said, so there was one time that I thought I was being careful and I avoided all of those insects. And then I make it to the train. And then when I take off my backpack, I see one sitting, like, basically on top of it. And... When I googled it, yeah, sorry, it looked like it's, I think it's poisonous or whatever. I don't know, maybe I was mistaking, but I really sound like a chicken. Yeah. Now, I know, yeah. like obviously, <laughs> right? <laughs> but I don't know, Mel, I don't like... I mean, you're I, still I with us, so I think that's the most important <laughs> yeah. thing. That, like, centipede, clearly. Are centipedes toxic? Like, um, I don't know, I think, poisonous? I think there definitely are centipedes that are more toxic. I don't... Oh, I mean, they're probably... Are, they're are probably, they in Japan? I don't know. I mean, I know there are some toxic snakes. In, I don't know. I'm going to have to look about the centipedes now. Maybe I should be more <laughs> wary. Um, um, again, I come from a place where there's nothing... In the UK, there's nothing that's going to kill kill you, really, um, animal-wise. Like, um, Really? Nothing? I mean, I guess you could get, like, TB from a badger, but, um, I mean, there's, there's very few animals that could really hurt you in a... You could guess a deer could probably kick you, or well, these are very cute animals, though. Like this is this that's is true. Like, yeah, yeah, at least you'll be killed by something you like. Something that, that, yeah, yeah it's nice. like getting killed by a centipede is not a way to go. Like, Maybe not for you. Maybe not for you. <laughs> yeah. Maybe. But anyways, right? Yeah. Like this. This has been so much fun. Yeah. I I think we exceeded the our previous that's, episode. We did it. You yeah. know. We did it again. We did it better. So I think so. Yeah. The, so, any last words for not not last words? Any you know a comment? Last comment for people who might be interested in following a similar career path, or people interested in doing a PhD, whether to come in Japan or not. Like, but what would be your advice? Um, I think my advice would be to. It sounds kind of naff, but to, to email people and speak to people. Like, I think people are always so on, forget how willing people are to talk about what they do and and discuss with people, um, reply to emails. And I don't know, I remember being younger and ne- nervous and would never want to email like a professor or something to ask them about something. But people are really, really, generally people are really friendly and want to answer your questions and want to help you. And um, if you do have questions about how things work and people are almost always willing to to help, to help out. Yeah. yeah. Uh, ResearchGate is one of those, honestly, during my PhD, yep. was revolutionary. Yes. Because yeah. I would just go there, ask questions, and the researchers from all around the world would start helping you out. Yeah. Can people love to help out? Like, it's surprising how... Right? Um, it's, I, I, I don't know. For, for me, I thought it was incredible. And uh, do do you recommend like using such a website or at least, you know, directly, like if I read a paper and I found something that I don't really understand, do you think it's a an effective way to just email the person in charge? I think, uh, the, I think, the, 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 yeah. What, what do you call the author? That, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, contr- yeah. Not contributing author. Uh, like the know. corresponding author. Corresponding yeah. author. I think almost always people are, I think most people are thrilled that anyone is reading their research. And yeah. most people are thrilled to answer questions. If they've spent, I mean, I don't know how, like, you spend, like, months, years on papers. Like, you spend a big chunk of your life. And um, if somebody wants to ask you about it, you're almost always thrilled to help. More than happy yeah, to, exactly. to yeah. answer, right? Yeah. Yeah, people want their research to do something. So. Well, yeah. okay, then. Thank well, you very thank much. Thank you so much, and thank you this for this. Been awesome. This, uh, this is the last, I think we just got this, so. Yeah, well. Bone apple tea. Bone apple tea, I guess. Yeah. yeah. I don't know what this is, but I'm, I'm going to go for it. No, I don't know either. Is it filled with anything? It's got, looks a little savory. No idea what it is, but it's good. Is it fish? I think there's tuna inside of it. 
No? I have no idea. Yeah. Chicken? Maybe. Yeah. And there's meat inside. There's there's something meaty. Yeah. yeah. It more look like a profiterole. Yeah. yeah. Anyway. Anyways, yeah. Thank you guys for the people who are still hanging out. <laughs> and uh, yeah, we'll see you in another one. Bye-bye. Wonderful.